Some weeks ago, uh, Craig Atwood sent me an email <clears throat> saying that uh, I want to introduce you to someone here uh, who has published a new edition of Comenius's Labyrinth of the World and Paradise of the Heart. And I think he might be a, a good speaker for one of your uh, Wednesday night programs. Well, I emailed Timothy L. Price, who's with us this evening, and asked him, could we get together on Zoom sometime? And we had a delightful visit, uh, getting to know each other and talking about possibility of a program on his publishing of Comenius's work in a new edition. Uh, Tim is uh, grown up in Nebraska, currently is talking to us from Kearney, Nebraska, which I remember from a family camping trip in the 1950s. We were going out Route 30, the Lincoln Highway. It was nighttime approaching in this huge thunderstorm it was coming down over Kearney, Nebraska in the North and the Platte River. Unforgettable. Well, um, he has grown up there and received his education there and included in that education was two years training in ex exegetical study of the Bible from cover to cover. And alongside of Tim's work in the world of business, he has followed out many interests in the, in the area of the Christian faith. Um, he has had a main focus on with the meaning of the kingdom of God and uh, is read more than 34 volumes on this subject. Um, he's also very been very interested in the Waldensians, in the whole Anabaptist tradition and in our ancient unity in particular. And what these all three have in common were that they lacked legal standing in their times. And they at times had to be an underground form of the church and suffered greatly uh, as a result of this. Um, Tim has published a book in, I believe, 2005, the diluted church calling believers to live out their true heritage. And he is connected, I believe, also with Ecclesia Press. Uh, and so he will explain anything he wishes to about that himself. So welcome, Tim, to our gathering. I'm so glad to be here. Um, uh, it's uh, been a long road for, for this particular project. Uh, and I'll just start off just talking about um, working on the project. Um, about 20 years ago, I came across a, a reference to a Christian allegory that I wasn't familiar with. I believe the book was The Pilgrim Church by E.H. Broadbent. Um, it's a great book about uh, uh, marginalized histories, um, dissident faith, this sort of thing, and it gives kind of a broad perspective of a not so well known era of, of church history or uh, ecclesial ecclesiastical history, I guess you'd call it. And I saw this reference to this book, The Labyrinth of the World, and it was written by a guy that I didn't know, John Amos Cominius. And I thought, well, this is interesting. So being the inquisitive type that I am, I decided to get a copy of the book through interlibrary loan and got the book. And I was absolutely floored. And oh, by the way, 
The book came from the town I now live in. I used to live in eastern Nebraska where the Platte River meets the Missouri River in a town called Plattsmouth. It's the only Plattsmouth in the entire world. But uh, at any rate, I uh, read the book, was absolutely floored. So I got my own copy, and that was the 1998 Polish Press uh, Western Spiritual Classics Edition. It is published by Catholics, and they attempted to make him sound a little bit like a Catholic, which in time I come to understand that uh, Comenius was not Catholic. Um, so um, I got another copy of it, which was the 1901 Count Lutzo edition, and that read more difficult than the first one. It was like reading Chaucer. And uh, not that Chaucer's bad, but uh, Chaucer's a little tough to read for the average bear today, including myself. So I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. And also there was sections of it that were quite a bit different. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So then I got a third copy from Oxford. And um, that one was interesting as well. And it read differently than the first two. And uh, the Oxford people, whoever did the translation, tried to make Cominius to be out to be a Calvinist, which uh, in my studies of uh, Cominius was patently false. Uh, Cominius was a man of his own uh, nature and, and his own thinking, and he worked with reformed people, but he definitely was not reformed, he himself, uh, whatever reformed means, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So back in those days, I thought, you know, it would be really great because I was so enthralled with this book that it would be made available in a much easier read than all the other editions that I had seen. There is another edition, a Matthew Spinka edition, 1942. I've not seen that one, so I don't know how, uh, how readable or easy to read it is, but I do know that the illustrated edition of it uh, um, that you get in leather bound is $850. So it's not very approachable for me <laughs> just to buy the full thing. But at any rate, um, I wanted to get something that was more readable because this book deserves uh, more readership than it has ever seen in the United States. Now, overseas, it's uh, well thought of, especially in the Czech Republic. And Comenius himself is also revered. There is uh, pretty near a saint uh, uh, as far as they're concerned. Now, many, many people do not know of Labyrinth of the World. They know of Comenius as an educator and a philosopher, um, but they don't know a devout writer uh, or a writer that works, uh, shall I say. At any rate, uh, I thought about adapting it probably in around 2016, but I was busy with work. And um, last year, you know, I guess it was 2020, mid-year, I was diagnosed with early onset dementia. And I lost my job, lost my house, had to move out to here to Kearney. And a lot of things changed. And I thought, well, okay, um, when life hands you lemons, you don't put them in the refrigerator and throw them at idiots. Uh, you make lemonade out of them. <laughs> so I thought, well, this is a perfect opportunity to take on this project and do something that I really wanted to do for many years. And so I called a historian friend of mine in, um, in Oklahoma. And I said, wait, given my situation and my condition, do you think I've got the horses to do this? He goes, well, I've never heard of this book before. And this is a guy that's very, very well read. He is a former presidential candidate for the Southern Baptist Convention. So he's no small fish and he's very well read. I saw his library the other day, I was astounded. So I sent him a couple sections and that I had already adapted. And he, he called me the next day effusive. And he said, you have to do something with us. You literally have to do something with us. And he's been behind the project ever since and uh, helped fund the project. And it took me 20 months 
um, part of the 20 months, about seven or eight months was the actual adaptation because what I did was I took the 1901 edition, a Catholic edition, and I looked side by side, um, line by line, paragraph by paragraph to see what Cominius was really trying to say and see how the, the translators parlayed it to, to see, okay, um, is there something in between um, that we're missing here? And so we made the adaptation. And the part of the book, uh, I'll just go sidetrack here uh, uh, from the adaptation because I want to get more into the book itself and why it's important to me. Um, for instance, um, let's see here. I found that the book is very similar to another book that is very, very well known called Pilgrim's Progress. And I would bet almost everybody on this call knows of that other book. Um, but what's interesting to me is that it is by far and away different than Pilgrim's Progress as it is similar. Uh, both stories are told in two parts. Both stories feature a similar protagonist, pilgrim or Christian who is a pilgrim. Both stories are uh, allegories. Both stories, the protagonist is guided on their journey through the world by a set of characters with character trait names. Um, and both stories have a story of redemption. However, that is where the similarities stop. Pilgrim's Progress is focused upon getting to the celestial city. It's kind of ethereal to me. Um, it's about, it depicts a world as something that has to be tolerated on the way through until I kick the bucket and I go to be with Jesus someday and it's all better for me. Um, Pilgrim's Progress makes no attempt to illustrate or to teach a transformed life. Pilgrim's Progress doesn't illustrate a life of service an ambassadorship to the world around us. But Labyrinth does present a number of things that I really came to understand and, and love and appreciate. Labyrinth presents the reality of two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. It uh, depicts a, the futility of the world around us. Well, that's a big story there. Um, Labyrinth articulates a life of believer as one of being transformed. Um, scripture talks about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Labyrinth also speaks of union life with Christ. Um, Colossians 127b says, uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, Labyrinth shows us that Christ expects that we serve the world as ambassadors. And I thought that was absolutely remarkable as a, a, a book as, as I could find. In, in all my reading, I would say Labyrinth is probably a top 10 book. And so that's really why I wanted to adapt it and make it easier to read because I want other people to be challenged by this book. And this book also was just flat writing. It was uh, numbered paragraphs. Um, Thomas, I don't know if the Spinka edition has numbered paragraphs all the way through but all the other three editions that I have are like that. Each paragraph is numbered and uh, through, a, through a section. And uh, it's very hard to read because in some cases in dialogue, you don't know who is talking to whom. So I looked at the, the characteristic or the character of the, the, uh, the dialogue and I made assignments to the different characters, the three main characters in the book. One was uh, Pilgrim, of course. The other one, and everything he says, I said, or, you know, it, it was obvious who was talking. But Mr. Delusion and Mr. Ubiquitous, or Mr. Or Mr. Searchall, uh, it was not always clear who was talking to whom. And so by nature of the characteristic of the comments that were made, I assigned them to the other thing I did, and I'll show this on, uh, I'm going to share screen here. Uh, let's go to share screen and go to this one. 
um, what I did was I went through and I added illustrations because I thought illustrations help tell a story. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so what I did was, if I can get to it here, is I added illustrations to the, to the work. And here you have, can you see the screen, everyone? You have Mr. Ubiquitous showing uh, Pilgrim the way he wants to go. And he's kind of like Mr. Worldly Wiseman in, in, uh, in uh, Pilgrim's Progress. He's kind of a chunky guy. And he's one of these guys that's bigger than life. And he is uh, out to assure everyone that he knows everything. And he's uh, going to help you understand what you're looking at here. Here's poor Pilgrim being taken in by the, by the uh, Mr. Ubiquitous there. And then there are 16 illustrations throughout the book. Uh, here's the next one where Mr. Ubiquitous is joined by the guy on the left whose name is Mr. Delusion. And Mr. Delusion and Mr. <laughs> Ubiquitous collude to deceive Pilgrim, who's in the middle, and they put a, a, a bridle on him so they can control him. And they put a set of perspective correcting glasses on him so that what he sees through the glasses isn't actually what is there, but it's what they want him to see. And that's a key detail about this book. Um, now here you have the cover art that we put on the front of the book that shows the, the world as a, a walled city and it has six streets in it that, uh, different people live in different parts of the city. And you have the, down here, you have the, uh, the castle of fortune where the, uh, famous people and the, the, the rich and the, uh, the movers and shakers live. So that's a little bit about the book. Now, um, I mentioned that the two kingdoms thing is a big important detail me, to me. I grew up in the tradition of religious conservative evangelicalism, which is a lot different than you guys' tradition. And it is heavily focused on trying to manipulate the political order around us to being more favorable to us and to be more appearing like us. And it is thought that that is one idea of what the kingdom of God is. It's, it's, it's making the world a better place. It's uh, making the world uh, more moral and more um, uh, righteous on an exterior. Uh, well, Cominius's idea is that that's never going to happen, that the world is the world, and it's always going to be the world. It's always going to be awful, sinful, and nasty, and but that's okay because we have the kingdom of God that sits right next to it to show and to contrast uh, what truth is, what goodness is, what life is, what um, love is, in total contrast to the world, and I thought that was really remarkable because the way I grew up, oh, we're going to try to make the world a better place by our, our political action. We're going to we're going to legislate morality, and we're going to have uh, culture wars, and we're going to try to make people uh, fit our mold of what we think uh, goodness and righteousness is going to be. And well, thirty some odd years later in my life, uh, we see what kind of um, uh, havoc that has brought into this country where people will support one guy uh, who's not that nice of a guy and against a guy another guy who's not so nice of a guy and the whole thing is kind of going coming down around everybody's ears and I think that God would really have us be smarter than that and that's also what this book is about is about being the kingdom of God amongst the kingdoms of men the world is never not going to be sinful and never not going to be evil, but we can, we can be transformed and we can be encouragers and lovers and helpers and, and just uh, in con what the world does. doesn't matter if they do or don't do uh, good things 
even if they do good things for the wrong reason, it doesn't matter. Uh, we do good things because that's our nature, because we've been transformed from the kingdom of men and kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light here. And that's a message I never heard growing up. I heard we got to go out and try to make the world a better place, which is, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, when I was in Bible school, my mind began to unravel about these things because we were sitting around talking about the presidential election, the uh, Republican um, um, primary. And as some of you right, might remember, there were six candidates in those days that were vying for the, the top spot. And all the people in the Bible school were, well, we're going to vote for this guy. We're going to vote for that guy. Or no, this guy over here is a better guy to vote for. We, you know, we got to, we got to beat Walter Mondale or whoever it was. I can't remember. And um, a fellow from Uganda said, you guys are crazy. And we said, uh, <clears throat> excuse us. That's how it's done here. And he said, no, no, no. He said, if God told you to vote for a Pharaoh, meaning a totally ungodly person, would you do it? And we thought, huh. And unanimously said, well, God would never do such a thing. And he took us back to the Old Testament. He showed us how God did do such a thing. And it totally began to get my mind thinking about being as the Moravians were and the Anabaptists were and the uh, Waldensians were. And it started my study in that direction, which led me to the Labyrinth of the World book that we have here. Um, and in that book, it totally transformed the way I thought about the world around me. The world isn't something to be tolerated on the way through. Uh, this world is something to be loved and to re re be reached out to, which is not, again, the way I was uh, taught to think. I thought I was taught well, we will conquer, and that's what God wants us to do. And I, and now I completely disagree with that perspective because there's a lot more that can be gained from illustrating to the world uh, what it is not by doing the things it won't do. Gandhi once said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. And the reason was, is because Christians are so unchristlike <laughs> most of the time. And so I, I think it's a cursory lesson to us to follow Christ and to love people and to reach out to people that are marginalized or that are downtrodden and to do all the things that he wants us to do. And we see historically speaking that the failures of the religious community become the political footballs of, of the, the political order. And uh, I think God would really have us be a lot smarter than that and to be wiser in our life and in our living and our ministry and that's another thing that kind of drew me to Comitius and to the Moravians and the Anabaptists, uh, because that's their focus, and that's the way that they've lived for hundreds of years, and they've tolerated a lot of uh, persecution for being a testimony of truth and light rather than talking about it all the time. So those are some of the things that I found interesting. Now, uh, Thomas asked me to show you a little bit more about the, uh, the artwork here. And so uh, I wanted to do that. Now I'm going to share screens again, if I can get to the, uh, here we go. Uh, let's go here, desktop one. Can you all see the, the, uh, the artwork now? Yes. Okay. All right. So it might look the... better than for you to make it full screen. Okay. All right. Is that a little better? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So this is the initial thick picture that I showed you before. Uh, but then we have Mr. Fate here. And Mr. Fate is passing out everybody's lot in life. Uh, what they're, what they're, are expected to do in the world. And whatever lot you get, well, tough bananas, that's your lot. And uh, uh, the story is very interesting in that regard. Then this is a picture of death. And death 
goes and shoots people down with her bow and arrow. And uh, she gets the arrows from the people themselves. The people hand them the arrows by which she executes them with. I thought that was telling. Then you've got, hold on a second here. Then you've got Pilgrim along with Mr. Ubiquitous and Mr. Delusion on a boat. And they're going across the waters in one of their adventures. Um, and this picture has meaning on two levels. Um, Cominius, and this is mentioned in the book in the uh, introduction uh, in the prior editions and in the appendix in my edition, where this represents uh, Cominius's married life. He lost his entire family to the plague, his wife and two children. And he later wrote that it was like a flood or like a, 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 a torrent uh, on a, on a uh, body of water. And so he used that imagery to depict uh, something in the story and uh, also to depict his, his uh, desperation and horror at his own personal situation. Here you have a picture of uh, uh, Pilgrim observing uh, an apothecary where they're dispensing liniments and uh, salves and vitamins and all sorts of things to help people become better in life, only not really. And uh, Pilgrim is aghast at what he sees here as it is explained in the story. Then Pilgrim comes across a guy peddling these telescopes that make the world appear in a different way. You can see behind yourself and you can see around corners and various different things. Now, in this particular piece of art, the dialogue that it is based upon in the book um, really spoke to me. And so I really wanted to capture this in, in artwork because I think, again, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this book has a thousand more words than the average uh, uh, labyrinth of the world. And so I directed the artist who came from, or who is uh, from Brazil, that I wanted certain things drawn a certain way. And so I sent him uh, very crude drawings of what I wanted. He came through with uh, flying colors <laughs> in black and white. <laughs> um, then you have uh, a person who, Let's say he's part of a secret society or a, a, a society that has secret knowledge. And he's passing out these packages here. And he tells people that, hey, you can have some of the secret knowledge that we have, this uh, secret society group. And uh, he tells them, listen, but if you open it up, the, 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 the knowledge disappears. You know, so you can just have the package but that's it. You, you can't, you can't know what's inside. And so I thought that is very telling as well. Um, and here you have Pilgrim and he's going, he went to a church where they're selling images, uh, in the, the image of Christ, not Christ himself, but an image of Christ. Isn't that kind of a, a telling um, word picture. And here you have uh, Pilgrim observing the kings of the world who are in the middle of this picture, and they're hearing uh, petitions from the people of the world who are in the bottom of the picture, and they talk through these tubes, and the tubes have holes in them, and so the words as they're going up through the tubes fall out, and they they don't really all of them get to the king. So it's kind of like talking on a, a cell phone where people, you know, the words break out all the time. You don't hear everything or maybe listening on Zoom. <laughs> but uh, the words and the, the requests don't all get to the king up here. But uh, the king make answers anyways based upon the guidance of uh, the people in the top, these uh uh, lobbyists who tell the king it's what to do. Now, is this, if this is not a picture of what goes on in this country today, I don't know what is. Very telling picture. And here you have Pilgrim observing uh, the uh, the den of the hedonists. And the den of the hedonists is one of my favorite parts of the book. It is very descriptive. 
It's perhaps crass in a way, but it is very true to life about the realities of parts of the world that we're in and how people are um, uh, medicating themselves in ways and uh, are zoning out by use of chemicals or liquids or uh, activities and anesthetizing themselves from other realities of life. And here you have the tower of the immortals and certain people that are really a cut above the rest and who are magnificent on every level get into this tower, but people get into this tower and get out of this tower and they're displayed there, uh, but maybe they fall out of vogue. So they're not really as immortal as they would like to think or as they want others to think about them. I thought that was a very telling detail. And here you have pilgrim before queen wisdom. Uh, and this animal is uh, one of her um, sidekicks in the story who uh, uh, we use kind of a mythical character in this regard, but uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, then you have Pilgrim at the edge of the world, and he is despondent because he can't make a decision about the world because it only contributes to being uh, vain and violent. And, and despairing and, and spreading uh, despondency. And he doesn't want to be part of that. He's, he's very moral and, and, and he's, very, uh, he's very smart, but he can't see joining the world as he, as he saw it because everything was just complete vanity and his, his guides, Mr. Ubiquitous and Mr. Delusion have abandoned him. And uh, he's there all alone on the edge of the abyss and wondering what to do and his, his glasses have fallen off and he's at a, in a real spot. And then he meets Christ and Christ welcomes him back to his own heart to dine with Christ, to, to understand, to listen to Christ. And it is this, at this point that Christ transforms uh, Pilgrim and uh, speaks to him and uh, welcomes him to his kingdom and uh, is very, very personal and very, very touching. Um, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the most touching um, passages of, of um, non-inspired um, uh, writ that I've ever read. Very, very uh, inspiring. And then in the end of the book, all of the pieces that have busted apart in the world are magically coming together because God's bringing them together to work to his purposes and for his, his, his uh, will. And, and Pilgrim is watching this happen. And so these are very telling passages that I wanted illustrated because I thought that it would help people to understand the book better. And, uh, make it more engaging for even a younger audience. The book reads at a ninth to 10th grade level um, very easily. There's not any $500 words that I'm aware of in it. And uh, uh, the reason that I wanted that is because my teens really enjoyed this book. I got it uh, back when they were probably in their very, very early teens, maybe even preteens. And I read it to them because I wanted them to read. I wanted them to be challenged by a book. And allegory is wonderful because it speaks to us at a level that plain words just won't. If I told somebody the same thing this book is telling in plain words, they'd probably dismiss me or they'd probably say you're nuts. But as Christ did, he told many stories, which are just many allegories to make his point. And if somebody really wanted to understand, they would understand. If they didn't want to understand, well, they'd make all sorts of excuses and, 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 and dismiss the whole nine yards and miss the, the forest for the trees. But um, this book really spoke to me uh, over the years because um, of the background I had and because God was really working in my mind to change me from um, the aggressive 
religious conservative evangelical that I used to be to being more of a, a people person who wanted to understand people and could think about things and was secure enough and not threatened about what the world was doing or not doing for me that I could be of service to people without feeling threatened by them. And I think that's a, a really big lesson learned in life is to not be threatened by what people can do or not do for me or do against me. And so um, what else can I tell you about this book? Um, there are 37 chapters where a pilgrim goes to the world and he goes through every aspect of the world, whether it's politics, medicine, law, uh, the trades, um, uh, the political order, the uh, military order, and, and everything. And you might think he's a malcontent or that he's a chronic complainer as his guides uh, dismissed him at one level or another, or they derided him for being too choosy. But I think as you get through the book, you can begin to see that Pilgrim is a very, very thoughtful person, um, kind of like I want to be, I guess. And um, that spoke to me. And then there are 17 chapters, uh, the second part of the book, The Paradise of the Heart, where he meets Christ. And then Christ transforms him. But it isn't for going to heaven to be with Jesus someday. It is so that he can represent his new kingdom pilgrim's new kingdom within the kingdoms of men and so christ sends him pilgrim back to the world that he has just traversed to be light truth and a reality that the world cannot be for itself because those things aren't motivated and inspired in christ they're motivated and inspired by selfishness or best intentions or um greed or how I will be perceived by other people, selfish motives or these things. When Christ transforms us, that kind of stuff gets kind of eliminated and, and God adjusts it in our mind to where we can serve him for him instead of him for what we can get out of it or what, what we might receive in return. So I, I really, really enjoyed this book for that reason. I enjoyed it also because my children enjoyed it and my children were inspired by it. And I thought, this is a book that deserves more time and deserves to be um, better understood and more widely read. So that's why we made the adjustments in it. And uh, uh, we stayed very true to the text the original book, um, as I stripped it out of uh, either Lutzo or uh, the British edition, is about, about 59,000 words in total length. And this book is 62,000 words. So he stayed very, very close to the text and did waller it out with all sorts of extra things. Now, I made some adjustments in word usage was one of the main things that I did. Instead of using the word Christian, which is almost a meaningless word anymore, I mean, there are uh, white supremacists that are Christian, and there are politicians that are absolute reprobates and that fly on, on airplanes with pedophiles um, who are thought to be Christians, call themselves Christians, and are accepted as Christians. And well, if that's true, that word is almost meaningless. So what I changed and used instead is, follower of Christ, because that's so obvious and so um, um, so true, so elegant, because either we're following him, Christ, or we're not. It's very, very obvious. I mean, Christ doesn't go around murdering people, and he doesn't go around with pedophiles on airplanes, and he doesn't do white supremacist stuff, and he doesn't do a lot of other things, but he does serve people, he does love people. He treats women with respect and honors them. And he reaches out to marginalized people. And he encourages his believers to be the kingdom of God amongst the kingdoms of men, because the kingdoms of men are never going to be the kingdom of God. 
So I think it's become very obvious. The other word that I changed a bit um, was uh, the word instead of church, which has come to mean, mean a building in a locale that I can go to and I can visit, I can serve God if I want, or I can warm pews and throw money, um, to the word ekklesia, which is the Greek word that church uh, was translated from. And ecclesia is a completely different concept altogether. It's about being uh, God's um, um, senators or congressmen and metting out, so to speak, what it means to be the kingdom of God amongst the kingdoms of men. It's about um, it's about community. It's about uh, uh, belonging. It's about a lot of other things, but one thing it's not about is it's not about a building in a locale that I can say I serve Jesus in. It's about being. It's not about doing. And it'll involve some doing, of course, but it's about being uh, what God intends us for us to be. And it's about the community of that being. So if there are problems or difficulties or misunderstandings, we as a community adjust those things and we deal with those things within ourselves to correct the issue or to make it um, more practical or more um, efficacious, whatever it is. Um, we're not depending on the world to define who we are and what we should and shouldn't be doing according to their way of thinking. And so the word ecclesia is very, very important and something that uh, the religious community can afford to wrap its mind around a little more. And there are now increasing works that are available about the difference between church and king or church and ecclesia. So this work, using the word ecclesia, I explain it just a very little bit, but people can go and research it. And now that people this concept difference, um, well, the word will speak for itself and people can be educated and encouraged in their walk with God about what that word means in their, in their particular locale and how they, how they can met it out uh, amongst themselves. So that, uh, that gives uh, a, a lot of details that I wanted to show something else. So I'm just going to show this to the camera. The, the book is very old school in its layout. Can everyone see that? That is a drop cap letter. So I had it illuminated in its, in its appearance. So it had kind of an old feel. Um, then there are what are known as pull quotes. And you can see here how we pulled a, a quote out of the text and we highlight it because it's either important or we're trying to use space. <laughs> so uh, we, we, use that technique and i wanted the book to feel old school i wanted the people to when they picked it up wow this is a quality book um another detail is about the book and i can't show this any other way is can everyone see the embossing on this yeah yeah and that's no easy trick and then of course we've got the the uh let the uh, gold embossing on the back they call this actually a deboss here uh, with this. So um, I really wanted to honor Mr. Cominius because of his contributions to education and to the church. And I wanted people to have more of an understanding uh, about him in general. In the back of the book, now I'll go back to share screen here. And Thomas, how are we doing for time? Uh, fine. Uh, could you show us the cover in its full color also? you Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll uh, get up here and we'll share screen. And there you go. So that one picture, the fourth picture in is colorated here. And uh, the reason that I uh, put this gold uh, banding on the front where it says the original pilgrim allegories because I want people to know and understand that uh, 
uh, that Pilgrim's Progress is not original, that it was inspired by the works of another person. And that person is John Amos Comenius, the great Moravian, as Spinga called him back in the 40s, the 50s. Um, and so it's also a marketing tool because many, many people revere Pilgrim's Progress as um, next to inspired. <laughs> And that's fine. It's a very good book. I enjoy it. Uh, I have a copy. Of, I have two copies of it here. I enjoy it very much. But in my opinion, this is actually a much better book because of what it's communicating, what it's telling us as, as um, followers of Christ and what it's encouraging us in our lives in the what Tozer used to call the nasty now and now. Uh, we have to live in the world and we have to be God's kingdom amongst the kingdoms of men. And I, I think I, I can't say that enough. Um, also, I'm going to share screen on a different uh, level here, uh, Thomas. Um, there's another text here or another <laughs> section here where I wanted to show a little bit of the artwork inside. Um, there is a section in the back of the book um, that and I'm going to share screens here. Advance. Okay. Now where is allowing me to do this? Okay. So in the back of the book, there is a section about understanding Comenius then and now. Um, now in all of the other uh, editions that are out there, um, there are, uh, there is a 55-page introduction in front of the Labyrinth of the World, the Paradise of the Heart, which, in my opinion, you could be punch drunk by the time you get to the actual narrative. And I thought, I don't agree with that approach. I don't think that people are so obtuse that they can't understand Comenius and his allegory and its application to our life. Uh, so I went and I um, put together a more brief and concise section about Comenius. So there is a section in this part that's about Czechoslovakia and the background history. Then you see the actual era Comenius was born into. And so you understand him as a person. And this is some artwork that is in the back. I actually uh, bought uh, copies of this artwork from libraries like Cambridge or UCL in London. And I went, uh, Comenius believed in edu education should envelop a learner. And I understand that pictures are a way of enveloping people and helping them to understand. Now, this picture is about the war of 16 called White Mountain, the Battle of White Mountain, which is what Comenius, on his life's work, he had been educated in Herborn and in uh, Heidelberg, and he was a pastor and an educator in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, but this event changed everything, and he was at that point became a hunted man uh, because he was not Catholic. Um, then later in this section, I also got an eight or a, a late 1600s uh, picture illustration that they used to uh, about the labyrinth of the world as it was 1631, I guess, uh, I, 1631 or 1658 uh, that I put in here because I wanted the people's the original art looked like book. Then further down. These are actual clippings from, I think, 1658 or 1659, uh, Orbis Pictus, uh, Thomas, which is uh, his uh, were the world in pictures. Um, and again, he's using stuff that he uh, had drawn to help educate people. Uh, and so I wanted people to see some of that work. And I explained many of his other um, writings in this volume so that people get a better understanding of him, uh, especially as it relates to um, education. Um, I also 
articulate his associations with various um, big shots in the uh, the uh, Puritan world, uh, Theodore Hayek, uh, John Dre, John Beale, and various other people, uh, which is how Pilgrim's Progress, or how John would have found out about um, Labyrinth of the World and what would have inspired it. Then later on in this section, we have um, a few pages down here, we have some more of the illustrations of uh, Cominius in some of his books. Um, and then we have uh, a picture taken in Cominius's time, or a not a picture, but a, um, a, illust or a, a, a painting, excuse me, that was done by Rembrandt. And this was not discovered until uh, maybe within the last 30 or 40 years that that was Cominius. And then uh, one of the last pieces of art that I have in this is uh, the uh, Alphonse Mucha uh, painting. Now this painting is literally 18 by 24 feet. It's monstrous in size. And I got a very nice scan of it. Then in the Nazi years, the Nazis used uh, Comenius, you see him on stamps, on their stamps to try the Czech people to their cause, shall we say, by using his image. And then the communists did it in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s uh, by putting him on their, their particular um, mintings and printings. And so uh, there you have it, the bibliographies. I did not spend as much time in this book, in this version, with uh, copious footnoting that you find in former editions. I see no reason to reinvent, reinvent the wheel a fourth time. <laughs> um, I wanted a book that, again, people wouldn't be put off by, by all the footnoting and all the, all the interruptive things that you find in some of these other editions. Another thing that I did was Cominius used a fair amount of um, Latin in the book that was left in the book, uh, even through the, the, the Czech uh, translation. And in former editions that I saw, Latin all, is all just kind of loose in the, in, in the narrative. And you're wondering if you don't know Latin, like I don't know Latin, and probably most of you don't. It's like, well, what is that? And you've got to go look it up or whatever. So what I did was I craftily wrote the definitions into the, the, the narrative so that people would understand it's less interruptive to the reading process. Um, and that's why I call this, this edition an adaptation. It's not a translation. I did not go from the Latin or from the Czech into English. I took other English editions and use them as a guide to what I understood uh, Cominius to be on a grand scale and what I could see that he was getting at in certain places where it was a little cloudy through the other, the other editions. We're at, uh, we're at uh, 6.30, Thomas. Uh, is that, uh, is that uh, practical for you? It is, and I noticed that Paul Morse, you had a question you had wanted to ask. Yes, hi Tim. I wanted to first share with you how much this presentation has meant to me. Uh, I've been a Moravian all my life, and we all, we Moravians, know about John Animus Comenius, but I had never read anything by him. And when I saw that you were going to do this, and I saw the um, the title, I decided to get one. And I actually went to Amazon and I got the one that uh, you got, the uh, classic the Western the spirituality. Yeah, the translation. Yes. And a, a couple of things that I wanted to comment about. One is it's interesting that this was uh, one of the first of Comenius's writings. He was very young when he wrote this. It was, uh, yes. it's one of the most cogent um, things that he wrote. And yet, um, later on, uh, he became a champion of, of uh, illustrating writings, and yet there's not a single illustration in this thing. 
And that's yeah. one of the reasons that it probably it didn't go over as well as Pilgrim's Progress, which is illustrated. Yes. So, now, um, now, one of the other details, Paul, is that Comenius's writing, this particular book, for instance, was, uh, uh, how's the word, anathematized, uh, and it was blacklisted for many, many years. It first was written, it was first published in 1631 in Latin, and by 1658, I believe it is, was translated into Czech or rewritten in, in Czech. Now, he he was somewhat like um, uh, uh, George Lucas with Star Wars, and he, he fiddled with it a little bit. So the edition that we have today is actually quite a bit different than the initial that he wrote in 1623, but the vast majority of it is the same. Um, as far as illustrations go, you're right, the first editions didn't have much in that way. But over the years, if you do some research, you will find that um, the artwork that has gone into this particular volume in its many, many publications goes from the bizarre to stuff like what I have. Um, and I think you're right. The, the, the pictures or the illustrations make it more endearing. The, uh, then as far as the, the uh, Puritans had a better machine. <laughs> and they had a whole, uh, whole machine behind them where Cominius was pretty much all to himself. You know, his, uh, he had his band of, of people around him that he drug around Europe all over the place but he didn't have the organization that, that the Puritans had. And that's another reason why it wasn't well known until, you know, more recently. But so that's just some other background details. Uh, let me let me just make a personal testimonial. Uh, I wish that I had discovered this book 40 years ago. It probably would have uh, changed my career path because truth be told, uh, I was overseas until 1977, came home and didn't have employment. I went to the state employment office and applied for unemployment insurance while I looked for something. And one of the consultants there, one of the um, interviewers um, uh, in talking with me said, hey, have you considered working for um, the Employment Security Commission? And I said, well, no, I really hadn't. And she said, well, you probably would be pretty good at it. So I applied and um, got the job, and I spent the next 40 years nearly being Mr. Ubiquitous and leading, <laughs> leading people to look for jobs. And one of, the, <laughs> one of the major problems that I had with that was that during much of that time, I felt that, in fact, we all are in, employed. Um, our job is to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't say that because I worked for a state agency. So I was um, basically in a position where I had to keep my mouth shut and just do the job as it ubiquitous did. And I'm now in, uh, <coughs> retired, so I can get away with some of these things that I'm saying. But uh, it, it, as I say, had I found this thing 40 years ago, I might have taken a different career path. Well, Paul, all is not lost because uh, St. Francis once said, um, share the gospel always, and if you have to use words, uh, we, we, we can say things, or we can say things by how we live and what we do, and how we carry ourselves. Not so much in what we say. You know, the, the evangelicals are, are famous for cheap words, but where is the living? Where is the the day to day reaching out to people and ministering to them at the point of their need? And that doesn't take words many times. It takes a lot of actions, you know, and, and, and uh, this book very much encourages me that way. Well, thank you for your, uh, by the way, where would I get one of the copies, a copy of your book? Um, well, it can be, it can be had through Amazon as well. Um, and uh, if you want, I can, I can inscribe it for you. How about that? I, I, I would treasure that if you'd be inclined, yes. <laughs> right. Well, um, what I can do is I can get a list of names of people who want the book and whatnot. And we can arrange it. Now, um, I, I would like to go through Amazon to do that because it would help me on a number of levels. 
uh, bookkeeping is the one of them. And, you know, people are used to doing, you know, trade with uh, Amazon. But I would be happy if you, uh, I can give you my email address and you can tell me, hey, I, I, I ordered this thing and I would be happy to inscribe it for you. It's, uh, it's um, this book is a treasure on every level to me. And, and I think it'll be a treasure to anybody else who reads it. Tim, could you put your email address in the chat, please? Yes. Okay, now, here we go. There we go. How's that? It can that see works. It. Okay. And if you, if you go to Amazon, um, the, you'll see the cover of mine. Uh, well, you may or may not. Uh, here, let me get a link and I can send the link to chat. And that'll be helpful and practical. Amazon. And there's no confusion because there is actually three different, uh, three different uh, editions of this then mine actually has three different editions because it's an audiobook, ebook, and in hardbound edition. Let's see here. Um, okay, we're getting there here very quickly. So let's see here. Post attendee. No, I want to do this. Here we go. So this right here is the link for my edition of it. There is also, like I say, an audiobook edition, and I put it on a USB jump drive. And I have a cheap car, but my my uh, car has a USB uh, a USB. Uh, um, what do you call it? Socket. Yeah, the, the uh, here, I'll show you the socket. Yes, I guess would be the best way to put it. And this is what the, the audio book will look like, at least this edition. Now, if you order off of Amazon, it'll be digital, but if you want, I can, I can include one of these with, uh, when I ship your book and it is a USB drive, you just Pull this out and you can put it in your computer and you can download it to your computer. Or like I drive down the street, we, my wife and I go on a trip and we just listen to the book and it's right there available to, uh, I'm a little bit older than some people, the young folks, they use a digital ed edition and uh, I have, I don't have all the devices and all that. I'm an oldster, so I do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> so there we go. It is fun to hear how you found Comenius and your experience with him. And I know that Craig Atwood was excited to, he's the one who told Tom about you. It sounds like you had reached out to him to ask him to take a look at the book. And Yes. Yes. Let, let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, I don't know uh, Craig at all, uh, but when I was when I was finished with the book, uh, adapting it, the first thing I did was I sent a copy of it to uh, a professor at the University of uh, Spring Arbor University, uh, and his name is Runyon, and Daniel Runyon, and he is a published expert on uh, Pilgrim's Progress. He's a 50-year literary professor there at, uh, or was, he's now retired, at Spring Arbor. I also sent it to another fellow whose name is, let's see here, um, Milos, uh, where is it? Milos Kaufman, PhD, at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana. And this was... Uh, um, uh, Howard Snyder put me on to these two fellas and um, I sent it to them because I wanted to, because I don't have a huge education 
and I'm not a linguist. And so I wanted to make sure the long hairs agreed with me and, you know, that uh, we were copacetic with all, all, all the big shots. And so both of these professors are 50 year veterans in the literary uh, professor business. And both of them are published experts in concerns to Pilgrim's Progress. And neither one of them had ever heard of Comenius's book before. And both of them endorsed the book. Well, then I was hunting for more endorsements. And that's where I got a hold of Craig at. And he was absolutely floored with uh, this rendition. He said, it's so much easier to read. And then I got an uh, endorsement from uh, uh, David I. Smith, who I'm going to be interviewing with uh, later next week. And he's the Couriers Institute for Christian Teaching professor, uh, director of education there at Calvin University. So this book has 24 endorsements, from, and most of them are from lettered people, which I find absolutely astounding because I'm not a lettered person myself. And uh, so that's a little bit more about the book um, and about, you know, what it took to put it together and what some other people think about it. I think Betsy had a question. It's not a question. <clears throat> I just want to thank you for the illustrations. And it does take me back. We had a book group at home church and we did read um, The Labyrinth. And so it takes me back. And then isn't there a film or something like that? Or am there I wrong? There, well, there's a film about Comenius himself, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a sea level movie. It's not that good. Um, I like it because I like movies and stuff like that. But it's not really, it's not like watching, you know, a, a, a an A list movie. Uh, and then the Czechs themselves recently did a, um, a, uh, let's see here, a. Uh, what do they call it? A uh, cartoon edition. Uh, I'll see if I can find it here shortly and, and put the link up to it. Um, now, I had a professor, another professor out in California, um, who asked me, once I get going with this book and it begins to, to generate a little money, he said, would you consider doing this in what they call a graphic novel edition? He said, because younger people gravitate towards that and i would absolutely love to do this book as a graphic novel um, because i think there's a certain type of readership that would latch on to it now you have to tell a story completely different uh, than you would in a in a, a long narrative written edition but i think it's absolutely wonderful uh way of reaching people and challenging people with a message so yes the, the Czechs did do a, uh, a um, um, cartoon edition. I forget the special animation. Um, I had I'll look it up. Well, cool. as you're looking for that, Tim, we thank you very much. This has been a treat. And if you don't mind staying around for a minute, oh, uh, when we're done in case anybody else has any other questions and just as a reminder next week sister Ruth Burkall is going to come back she is a member of Unity Moravian and is the executive director of City with Dwellings and she's going to take us on a deeper dive about the situation of homelessness in Winston-Salem and also Tom is going to provide us with an introduction for some of the nation's largest cities and how they've successfully instituted police reform. So it'll be a different topic, but that's where we're headed next week.